Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome again to the United Methodist Church of Plano. If this is your first time with us. Uh, the last few days, uh, last week into this week, we began a study through the book of 1 John or the letter of 1 John. Uh, we've, we've spoken that the letter of uh, 1 John is written to uh, already established Christians. And uh, we're talking about ways in which we stay anchored in Christ. On, uh, we're talking about ways on which we stay connected to Christ. Yesterday we really drilled down to uh, abiding in Christ and uh, knowing that uh, Jesus is the vine. We can do nothing without him. Our spiritual food, our sustenance, our very life is wrapped up in Jesus. And that we need to be on guard for uh, false doctrines, false theology. Uh, John is addressing some issues where uh, some, some false theology has creeped into the, to the young church. So uh, we pick up today in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to cover the first six or seven verses. We'll cover uh, the rest of the passage tomorrow. But um, John's going to be speaking to us in some about some difficult ways and he's going to be talking about um, our sin our tendency to sin and he's going to be pointing out uh, and we have to be very careful here uh, we're not to be sidewalk spiritual police but John is going to make a distinction between um, those uh, committed followers of Christ and those who who say they're in Christ, but they're really not. So we're going to dig into that. It's uncomfortable. And you know, if we do any kind of spiritual work, any kind of worthwhile spiritual work, uh, it, it's uncomfortable for us. And so before we get into the word, before we get into some of the, the difficulties and the details, let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, this is your word. Uh, you superintended it. You gave people the unction to write down what you said you've allowed them to to be to write in their own personality yet superintended by you the only way that we can understand your word and how to apply it to our life is if you holy spirit come and guide us through the reading and the teaching of first john chapter 3 and and really for any part of the bible uh, we can't really discern it we can't apply it we can't understand your word unless you guide us through it so father we're asking that today you would speak to us through your word that you would help us to understand what it is you're saying to us we ask you father in jesus name amen amen so first john Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. I remember, the Bible said, Jesus came to His own, and His own received Him not. So not only if His own people aren't going to recognize Jesus or not know Him, and the, the surrounding world doesn't know him or know his message or want to know them. Obviously, then, uh, we will have difficulties being his representation here. Now, in his power, we can be excellent ambassadors for him. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, that's Jesus, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself or herself as he, Jesus, is pure. So <clears throat> we're going to pause there. There's a lot in these first three verses. The, this idea... The, this exciting idea, the fact that we will know Jesus. Now, I don't know if we're going to know him completely, but it says we're going to know him as he knows us. Now, that, that should excite us. In fact, John says, And everyone who thus hopes in him 
purifies himself as he is pure. That hope, that excitement should drive us to be pure followers of Jesus Christ. To be pure as he is pure. Now, on one hand, we know that as broken, sinful people, perfect purity probably will not, in fact, won't happen here on earth. However, John is calling us in this continual process of holiness, of growing in holiness, of purifying our hearts, purifying our minds, purifying our thought process, our deeds, our way of life. Live in a righteous way. To show off? No. To act like we're better than anybody else? No. But to emulate Christ and who he is. And because we're excited that Jesus is going to come back one day, is going to call us home, that we do have a place in heaven, that we will be seated at his banquet table, it should excite us, it should drive us, to live in that manner. To continue to seek to be pure and holy. Even as Christ is pure. It's a high standard, unattainable without Christ. But we say often here that the goal for us as Christians is that when we look back six months, a year, ten years, fifteen years down the road, that we can have an actual honest assessment of our growth. We can see that we're not addicted to certain things that we were years ago. That we don't use the same language that we did years ago. That we're not controlled by anger that we were years ago. That Jesus is gaining victory in our life. That we are purifying ourselves and being purified with this hope that one day we will see him. John is saying this should excite us to change, to grow in our Christ-likeness. Uh, he begins, though, uh, with this, these words of tenderness and things to remind us of. See what love the Father has given to us. Some translations say, oh, what manner of love. John can hardly contain himself. He's trying to come to grips with this radical love that God had for us, that he would step out of heaven, be incarnate in human flesh, live a sinless, pure life, and give that life as a ransom for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins, that we might spend eternity in heaven. He, it's hard for me to actually comprehend. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called children of God? It, it's, it's amazing. Hey, Lynn, good morning. There is power in Jesus' name. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. So we are. Remember, he's writing to Christians. So we are. That should be something for us to drive a stake in the ground and say, no matter what, you can't take this away from me. I'm a child of God. I may be broken down. I may be sad. I might be fearful. But nothing can take away the fact that you, if you're a Christian, are a child of God. The reason why they, didn't, they don't know us is because they didn't know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. Now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. What, what we're going to look like in heaven, what we're going to look like on that final day when we stand before him, we don't know. But this we do know. When he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself who is pure. Now, we're going to get to the difficult stuff. If you remember uh, last week, I talked about having some dental work done. Whether it's dental work, medical work, whether it's gardening, whether it's uh, restoring an old car, whether it's restoring an old house, you have to, I have to, we have to do this hard work of getting behind the layers. Whether you're drilling out a cavity, 
Whether you're digging holes or tilling ground to plant corn, plant beans, plant flowers. Whether you take on a project to restore a classic or antique car, you don't know what's going on until you dig in. And sometimes the digging is painful. This part may be a little painful. Verse 4. Everyone who makes practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Verse 5. You know that he appeared, that's Jesus, in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. That's how he could be the Savior, because he's sinless. No one abides in him, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. That is a frightening statement that we need to unpack. So, I want to read for you uh, a couple of things from Paul's letters. First, I want to read from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 5. It pertains exactly to what we're talking about in John. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. So what's he talking about test? Look, we go back to John. John is talking about sin. Paul is saying, test yourselves, go back, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. He said, if you so you see if you don't fail the test. The test is, are you saved? The saved person, the one who's been redeemed by Christ, can pass the test. Now, I'm not totally sure what the test he's talking about, but I think he's talking about living a Christ-like life. Now, let's get back to John for a moment, and then we're going to go to uh, Colossians. So, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Well, that sounds like we're all in trouble. Hey, Red, good morning. So, we've acknowledged that we sin. John said, if we sin, we have an advocate. And if we seek forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now John is saying, if you make a practice of sinning, you're not of him. What is he talking about? That's about as clear as mud. Here's what I think he's saying. I think John is saying the spirit-filled Christian, the converted Christian, once sin has been acknowledged, wants to get away from that and doesn't keep on doing that sin. I don't think John is talking about a sinless life. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told us there's a way of forgiveness. Not for eternal salvation, but for a restoration of relationship. So here's an example. Someone comes to you and says, I've noticed this pattern in your life. I notice that you continually steal. Every time we go to a store, you steal. You continue to take stuff that you didn't pay for. You acknowledge that as sin, but you keep on doing it. So it could be sin, could be gossip, could be lying, adultery. You name the sin. John is saying, look, once it's been revealed to you, you need to repent, get right with God, turn from that sin, and continue seeking Christ to help you get victory over that sin. Not to acknowledge it and keep on doing it. I think John is talking about repetitive rebellion against God. Knowing what you're doing is sinful and doing it anyway. One of my favorite preachers, one who I can't wait to meet in heaven, is Dr. Adrian Rogers. Dr. Rogers used to pastor Bellevue Baptist Church in Tennessee. And uh, I believe, actually, he, he is still on the radio you can still catch his sermons today. There's thousands of sermons. And uh, 
uh, I believe as Love Worth Finding Ministries. I believe, I'm not sure what radio station is still on, but if you look up Dr. Adrian Rogers, I think you'll find it. He is, he was a phenomenal preacher and theologian. And one time preaching on sin, he said, look, I can sin all I want. I can sin my head off. But because I don't want to disappoint my Heavenly Father, because I love my Savior, I don't want to sin. I want to sin less. I don't want to use the grace of God to do whatever I want. That's what John's talking about. Not abusing grace. Acknowledging whatever sin that we're struggling with and fighting against it with Christ help that's what John's talking about he's not talking about I don't believe in absolute sinless perfection for broken human beings he's saying if you continue in this sin well let's just have his words so remember this isn't me this is the Lord Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides, there's that word again. Now you see how important abiding in Christ is. Continuing to grow this relationship with Jesus. Speaking to him, praying to him, asking him for help, reading his word. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. And no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or knows him. That's scary. There are many people who say they know Jesus. Lots of people know Jesus. Know who he is. They've heard of him before. But it is the converted Christian who cannot continue in a besetting sin and who will do whatever it takes to turn from that sin and cling to Christ for forgiveness and cleansing and move on. Now, is there other sins that we struggle with? Absolutely. Do we continue to seek forgiveness? To, to continue to grow in righteousness and Christ-likeness? Absolutely. John is not saying, if you sin, you're not a Christian. What he's saying is, if sin controls your life and you're refusing to turn away from it, then you need to question, as Paul says, are you in the faith? Now, I want to read for you a passage from Colossians. Colossians is one of my favorite books, one of my favorite letters of Paul. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Ah, so another addition to this is to have a thankful heart. And I think some of the thankfulness is, is that we don't have to remain in a sinful state, a sinful mindset. We don't have to be controlled by our desires, but we can surrender our life and be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, by the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity to say no to sin. But it begins where Paul says, being deeply rooted, or as John would say, abiding in Christ. Go back to when you first became a Christian, and the excitement you felt, and the freedom you felt, knowing that your sins had been forgiven. Remember that. Build on that. Grow on that. Be excited that one day, you will stand before the Savior. He said, John said, those who have that hope 
purify themselves as he is purified. Now, don't think that I'm sitting back here all comfortable in my little church pew and thinking that your pastor has it all together. I don't. This passage is just as convicting to me as it is for some of you. We are all in this together. We're all in different roads or on a, on a different part of the path to Christ. John is saying, continue turning away from sin and turning toward Christ. And that's a hallmark of a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus talks about, before he goes to heaven, that uh, those who were with them but didn't remain with them. And John says it too here. We've already talked about this. That those who were with them didn't remain with them because they weren't really with them. Meaning, they didn't have the same mindset. They weren't thinking Jesus as Savior. They, they didn't want all of this control. They didn't want to surrender their life. So they looked like Christians on the outside. But they weren't really with Jesus. They didn't know him. Nor did they want to know him. Paul says continue to examine yourself if you're in the faith. We're called to reflect upon where we're at with Christ. What's our relationship with him? Is it, is it dried up? Is it non-existent? And if so, why? Are we growing in vibrancy? Are we praying more? We have to ask ourselves, where are we in our faith? And if we're just barely hanging on by a few, uh, fingernail, then cry out to Jesus. Cry out to a friend. Call someone who will understand, who will pray with you, who will walk with you. Be assured of this. One thing, though, loved one, God has not given up on you, so don't give up on yourself. Continue to be deeply rooted in Christ Jesus, our Lord, as Paul told the Colossians. He is our only hope. I have no idea what your future holds, but I do know that Jesus holds your future, and you can grow closer with Jesus beginning today. Don't put it off. Even if you don't feel like reading his word, read it. Feed on it. And be honest with Jesus. And he will minister to you. He will not leave you hanging. He will walk with you no matter what. Man, that is exciting. That is a hope that we can trust. And how do we know this? Because our Savior came as he said he would. He died as he said he would. And he rose again as he said he would. Conquering sin and death and separation for you. Because of the radical love he has for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we don't like this. We don't like being called sinners. We don't like being called out. We don't like being poked and prodded. We don't like digging around our dark heart and finding the areas in which we need to repent. Some of the areas that we've set apart for you that you're not allowed in. Some of the compartments in our life that we've walled off and told you to stay out. It's uncomfortable. But Lord, we know that in the end, it is worth it. So help us. We are broken. We need your comfort. We need your vision. We need your wisdom. And we need your continued love, comfort, and help for us. As we seek to purify, our, purify ourselves. As you are pure, we cannot do it without you. Jesus, you must help us. You have to do this work in us. We pray it all, Father. 
with great expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. And I'll see you tomorrow. We'll be back in 1 John chapter 3. We'll pick up in verse 7. Have a great day. Amen, Kathy. Good to see you. Jeannie, good morning. Good to see you.